you do this, and this is a slide I've shown before, but um, this shows two elements, the potential support ratios, so people working versus people retired. And right now we have about 617 million people over age 65 today going to 1.6 billion uh, by 2050. Um, and we're not having the backfill, as you can see from the below chart, where you don't have, you're having a decline in the population uh, in the birth area from zero to 14. So what we're seeing is um, greater demands on the system in two forms. One is you're gonna have people living longer, working longer, but needing different skills because the jobs that they had for most of their career when they retired, they're still gonna have to work and are gonna be moving into um, either satellite careers or different jobs, or they're gonna work because they're forced to or because they want to which means you're gonna to have to work longer and need new skills as your career progresses because you're gonna have longer <clears throat> lifespans. The second thing is on the millennials, they're gonna have an average of six job switches. So if you're switching jobs six times, you're gonna to have to learn and relearn skills at a very fast pace. The other issue that is a big issue of, of focus and it was touched on earlier is inequality. And I wanna focus on it in two different ways. Mark, if you go to the next slide. I wanna focus on inequality in two different ways. Um, this chart shows low income countries uh, to middle income countries to high income countries. And what it basically says in the dark blue on the left side of the page is that um, almost 70% of the people in low income countries will not learn basic primary level skills. And the light blue box there is, uh, will learn minimum secondary skills. If you go to the far right chart, that is the mirror image for high uh, income countries. So what you're seeing is the big divergence in low income versus high income countries in terms of where they are in their educational levels. What's important about this is a lot of the population growth going forward is gonna come out of uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and African nations, which is a big part of the low uh, income countries. So we have to make a change to get this, these bars changed if we're gonna have a more equal, a more um, fairer global system with less strife. So Mark, if you go to the next page, it's not just intra-country, but it's, um, it's inside, it's intra-country, not just inter-country. So Mark, the next slide, if you could. It shows the differences in wages by, in the US by education. Um, and just to give you the short version of this, the difference between a no high school diploma and a bachelor's degree is twice the earnings. The difference between uh, that and a advanced degree is almost uh, uh, three times the earnings on a weekly basis. So critical that we get the education levels up and make the system fairer across the board. Um, so if you go to the next slide, Mark, this also flows through to employment. And this looks at the peak of employment in 2010 versus today. Um, and it looks at it for no high school degree, high school degree, some college and college degree or higher. So this just reinforces how critical education is to the whole system. And then Mark, if we just go to the last slide, I'm gonna just cut through this uh, quickly. Um, three things you really need to know about how we see the world going forward. And I think the challenge for educators in our educational system. The first is that, um, and this is according to the Boston Consulting Group, but 49% of employers cite difficulty recruiting today. And that's because students need to learn better communication skills, better critical thinking and better collaborative skills to succeed in the 21st century workforce. And the other key element is that 85% of the jobs that students are learning uh, that today's learners will be doing in 2030 have not yet been invented. And that goes back to the technological advances. So we focus on these three areas of um, technology, demographics, and inequality as the solution, as the problems that we have to solve for going forward. And as Nestle Mandela said, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. We believe that's the case, but we're gonna have to go through a lot of change and redirect spending. That's not a problem in the US because we spend more than anyone else does or almost as much as anyone else does, uh, but we have to spend it better. And I'm anxious to hear from the panelists as to how they're gonna take us to the next level to fix this problem. So thanks, Mark. Sorry for the technology problem.
No, no. I told you I would have these slides by backup, but I didn't actually want you to use me. But, <laughs> that makes two so, of us. <laughs> Lisa, um, come come join us and, and share your your perspective. Good morning. Hello, everyone. I hope everyone's doing well. I'm also going to show my screen. I have just a couple slides that I want to show. Uh, give me hey, one sure. here. Let me, I'll stop sharing. Okay, thank you. Good to see you, Lisa. Good to see you too, Mark. Let me just get this up. Uh, so I'll just say this, I'm Lisa Coleman. I work at New York University. I've been at New York University for about two and a half years. And I am the Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation. Um, I have, um, done this work for a number of years, including um, some work at Harvard University, and that was, I was there for almost eight years. Okay, can you see my screen right now? Yep. You have a lot going on like me. Can you hear me? Can you see it? I don't know if I can see it. Yep. So NYU yep. is a global institution. We have campuses in Abu Dhabi, Sydney, Accra, all over the world. We're the most international university in the United States. Um, I, um, I work um, mostly in Abu Dhabi and um, in the US and Shanghai. I spend about 70% of my time on, on the road. When I think about NYU, this is what I think about the work. And so to tie into, um, into the former comments that were made, we have a lot of things going on. So I'm gonna actually start by talking a little bit about the generational work that was mentioned before. We have the uh, NYU Aging Incubator, which brings together, as was mentioned earlier, their, um, when we think about the people who are over the age of 65 or really over the age of 55 right now, we're looking at about a 901 million, million people. And then by the time this 2050, we're looking at 40.1 billion people. And so we have a number of initiatives to talk about how we work across these generations. I'm very excited about this work. Uh, we've actually piggybacked on something called Teen Years, which is Teen Years Educating Adults Around Digital Inclusion. Um, we've done that this during the COVID-19 era, and it's proving to be very useful. Obviously, in terms of AI and robotics, when we think about the future of work, uh, these are very exciting initiatives. And we just opened a new makerspace in Brooklyn, where, where we have our other part of our campus. And the makerspace brings together our business school, as well as our School of Engineering, our School of the Arts, and, um, and also our School of Education, Teaching and Learning, in particular our Media and Technology Institutes. This is a new effort to really think about transdisciplinary, or as we say, cross-disciplinary learning, and again, bringing this across the multiple generations. We have a hackathon that we do every year in the Arab world uh, for social good, so really thinking about um, how do you use technology for the social good and thinking about social entrepreneurship? We have an NYU Founders Labs for um, people of color and for women. Many of you know that for uh, virtual, uh, for um, investments, women and members of um, uh, marginalized communities do not get the kinds of investments historically that others do. So we're very excited about this work. And as I said, this hackathon has been going on for a number of years. We've, we've received a number of awards. We usually host it in Dubai uh, or Abu Dhabi. Uh, we also have our, we just uh, did, hired someone actually in this world. So many of you know, if, if we think about the future of work, one of the other things that we're seeing with the shifts are people with disabilities and uh, as it doesn't matter if you're old or young and so thinking about neurodiversity and so we have a new labs at NYU we're very excited working with people on the autism and Asperger's um, uh, continuum many of you know places like Home Depot and other companies uh, SAP uh, which is a big large company has also found that people working uh, people who work in these areas are actually very who have these kinds of quote unquote disabilities, really are assets. And um, those assets actually help build things like algorithms and all kinds of things in the technology spaces. Um, we also, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, we know the changes in, in retirement. The other thing that's happening is women are living longer. So we have a new initiative at NYU looking at women um, and the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which is this year, uh, 2020. 
100 years, the centennial, so taking a look at that. And then it was, as mentioned earlier, we have a number of initiatives focusing on inequality, racism, and other things in that area. So when I think about the future of, uh, of education, and particularly higher education, as I said, I worked uh, at NYU, Harvard, Tufts, College of Worcester, Ohio State, uh, City University of New York. I've really worked um, across the public and private sphere of higher education. And so when I um, think about it, I just think there's so many um, amazing opportunities. When we think about Generation Z, and I'll end with this, uh, Generation Z are the people in college now. Everybody thinks they're millennials, but they're not. Millennials are older. They are already having children. And, um, and their children are the alphas often, and the alphas are those 10-year-olds giving speeches. So one of the reasons I stay in higher education is because I'm super excited about the possibilities of entrepreneurship, of innovation, of technology, of the future. These are the most diverse generations in history. They will be the most educated. And so they are what I'm resting my hope on. Thanks so much. Thank you, Lisa. <clears throat> I'm sure there'll be lots of questions. If so, I want to I want to put all the, the spectrum of the themes on the table and then we'll, we'll have this uh, interactive discussion. I, uh, is my screen back on? I'll put it on. Uh, there we go. So next, uh, um, <clears throat> Eric Lindberg, can you uh, just share your perspective particularly? I know you could share 25 perspectives, but if you could just focus on what you're doing in the, in the, in the prison system, I think that would be very useful. Yeah, Mark, and, and uh, if you don't mind, and, and I'll try to, uh, by the way, I'll keep, you're on my screen, so start waving if I filibuster too long, because you know that I'll take the remaining, like, hour to talk about seven education topics. R real real quick, uh, Mark, I'll come back to the prison uh, uh, topic towards the end of this comment, uh, because I actually want to react to a couple things that Stephen and Lisa said, uh, and also point out uh, Kathleen uh, Brown is asking, I think, a great question uh, in, in the comments section for, for folks to consider if you haven't seen that. Um, I'll make a general, uh, two general comments about the state of higher ed today, like major issues I think facing everybody. Um, the, and, and we didn't directly hit this, uh, I heard it the other day, the, 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 like the psych, not skills, but like the psychological preparedness of, of 18 year olds today seems to have declined dramatically um, to, to operate independently in the traditional format that higher ed has pursued. And what I mean by that is, and, and Adam Wein, and I'm going to give a number of Denison plugs, I apologize. Adam Weinberg has described this in, in varying ways, like really more specifically than I can, but that, that we've sort of like beaten the resilience out of young people in, in a way that hands off a whole host of, of problems on um, mental health and, um, and, and simply being durable enough um, and, 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 and those problems are being handed off from parents to, um, to, 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 to institutions of higher education that in many, many ways are not prepared at all um, for, for, you know, for the preparedness of 18 and 19 year olds today. I think it's, it's a major challenge uh, and I've seen it across a lot of different schools that we're involved with in, in the Midwest. People are struggling with, uh, with how, to, how, to, how to sort of transition education to accommodate some of those needs that we're inheriting from parents. Um, you know, I think intermingled with that, um, there's there's this broad you know sort of uh, you know media fetish for uh, for whether there's any return on investment um, in in higher ed and uh, you know I, I think there's a lot to debate and discuss there I think it's a super interesting topic that's interrelated um, you know Kathleen with the question that you posed uh, I think also with what what type of skills um, really should uh, should should we be focused on delivering to uh, to 18 to 22 year olds. Uh, and, and I'll point to Denison, I think, as being actually extremely innovative in, um, in aggressively engaging from the very beginning of the college experience today in, in preparing students uh, with career skills. And, and we're working on something now, Denison, that I think is a huge light year leap forward from even where Denison is today. Um, and I think this need to be not even thinking about career skills in, in the Career Services Center, but from the first moment that a student is engaging with an institute of higher education, how are you thinking about um, developing all of the human skills, um, the emotional intelligence skills, uh, the practical skills, the long-term thinking skills, while you have contact over a four-year four-year period, so so that we're able to sort of help transform um, and and open the mind 
of, um, of, of that person so they can enter society in a way that is productive and valuable to employers, but that also creates like life success and happiness and wealth generation for themselves over time. Um, the, some of those, um, some of those uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, goals require some really radical rethinks on, on the way schools are operating. And you didn't even talk about the prison subject. That's what I want to segue over to Chris. I well, so so uh, so, so Mark, that the the, uh, the that that can be said in thirty seconds. On um, you know, there there's I think there's some awareness, you know, that the the, the federal and state governments backed away from providing robust uh, education uh, to incarcerated individuals decades ago. Um, and th there are there are organizations that tend to be very localized and not well coordinated on a national basis that, that are back in prisons trying to bring higher ed uh, to to the, the the right part of that population. The real quick stat that should make everyone stop and think is uh, nationally felon recidivism uh, rates are 60 to 70 percent of folks end up uh, reoffending and, and being back in the system of individuals who participated in the programs that that we're connected to. Uh, in, in getting college degrees while incarcerated, now the recidivism rate has been uh, has been below two percent, um, and it's just a radical transformation of of the well being of those people, but even more importantly, society as a whole. Um, and uh, and and I think what's really needed there, from from what I've seen, is um, is more national coordination, moving away from sort of these ad hoc local operations. I think it's another area that higher ed could be much more engaged with helping our society. Great. Well. <clears throat> we scratched the surface on many things, so let's. Um, I, I wish we could go deeper, and we'll. And we'll, we'll I think I might extend this uh, half hour to a 40 minutes so we get some discussion. Uh, Chris, do you want to? Uh, I guess John is uh, not able to join, but you'll you'll carry the torch for uh, Oakmont. Sure. Um, and can I? I have a couple of slides I'll share. I don't know if I can share my screen. Yep. Okay. Can you see my screen? Um, not yet. Okay, let's see. Sorry about that. There we go. Let's see if they'll. Okay. Well, I don't know if it's going to. Let's make sure I can share. You just hit share screen, the green, yeah, green button there. I, I hit it. It's just like not, the, I think my firewall. I An educator, I have a lot of uh, firewalls. Oh, right. so I'll just talk about kind of what I was going to talk about. Um, so I don't have to contact my tech to let me go ahead and do this. Um, hi, I'm Chris Scalise Worrell, and I um, will let you know I am a former Opportunity Youth, and I'll talk about those here shortly. Um, I grew up in the Youngstown Warren area, and um, the child of immigrants and people that did not go to college but went into career technical education. My father was an electrician. Um, and so that kind of frames my passion for school choice, specifically dropout students. So charter schools across the country have existed since about 1991. Um, and that was in Minnesota where the first charter law was written. And now 45 states, including the District of Columbia, have charter schools. There's around 3.4 million students in charter schools, over a million on wait lists. Um, and I'm gonna go kind of now, instead of talking about the whole charter sector as a whole, I'm gonna talk specifically about dropout recovery because I think that segues appropriately here. Um, every day, every day about 7,000 students drop out of high school in the United States. One every 26 seconds, approximately 1.2 million a year. We also have 4.6 million, um, what we consider opportunity youth, which are students that are between the ages of 15 and 24 that are not engaged in any meaningful work education, um, they're either out on the street, they're at home, they're watching children that they have or their parents have. Um, and we know that high school dropouts make 200,000 plus less, like was spoken about before with, with Mr. Burke, than their peers. Um, and that's just peers who finish high school. And then we also know that about 75% of crimes committed are committed by high school dropouts. So it's a huge issue. Um, and so Oakmont Education, I joined Oakmont two years ago. I've been in this um, space of just specifically dropout recovery and charters since around 2002. Um, we serve around 3,000 students in 13 buildings. Our average student is 18 years old, reads at a fourth grade level when they come to us, have attended four schools, high schools before coming. Um, 
and have only around four credits towards their 20 credits needed to graduate. So you have, in essence, an almost 19 year old that is a freshman. So you can't be 19 and go into a public district and sit with 14 year olds in that class and feel like you're okay. It's, it's damaging emotionally. It's also very difficult um, for those students. So by the time they get to us, we, we have to kind of triage the loss. And so we need to make sure that their emotional well-being is taken care of and we kind of connect them with all the wraparound services that they need. Um, but I think the most critical component for our students and for students across the country with regards to dropout prevention and recovery is we, have a, we are entirely career technical and workforce development. So when we bring a student in and they come to us, we kind of tourniquet that issue that they have and we try to help them bridge those gaps, but we also get them involved in one of the career tracks. And it doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to stay, like if we put them in the healthcare or the construction or the manufacturing, they, in 20 years they might not be there. However, we, we do work with business partners that want to build a pipeline of students, urban students that can stay and live and contribute to where they are. So these kids are now, gaining their credits towards graduation and in essence at the same time we're using almost a glide slope so that we don't give them the credentials before they graduate because if you give a kid a credential before they graduate they're likely out and not coming back so Chris, okay. maybe a final, final wrap-up comment i want to get another perspective going sorry oh, about sir. that oh no that's okay so i i just think it's really interesting um you know with regards to dropouts, there we do all this work across the country and we do it at around 63% of funding as our traditional counterparts. So there are things that are working um, pretty well and, and I think we could do a lot more if people knew what people were doing out there to help, to help students like this that really nobody else wants to take the time to help. So thanks again, thank you. And I for one, uh, have been caught up for and I guess there's some myths and truths and myths to charter schools and issues around them so we'll, we'll uh, uh this has been useful to learn about your your perspective uh greg can i ask you to sort of weigh in what you're seeing you have to unmute yourself though unmute greg yeah and let me see if i can share a slide here real quickly uh, okay. somebody else let is me still there. Uh, anyway let me sharing let me jump in. I started out as a teacher in New York City at Martin Luther King High School, went from there to a national reform organization called the National Academy Foundation, which was started by Sandy Weil of Citigroup back in the 80s to try and channel more minority students into back offices in Wall Street. I uh, got to see 50 states and the high school environment there. Did some work with the Gates Foundation as uh, trying to change the high school model in the country and ended up working for Mike Bloomberg and Joel Klein in New York City where I oversaw all of the vocational schools in, in New York City trying to envision a different path to the skills challenge that we're all talking about here. What's remarkable to me in, in listening to this conversation and I know I'm new to the group is it pretty much parallels uh, the entire education to skills to workforce conversation of the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, we've been having this same conversation since I was bar mitzvahed in 1983 uh, when the Nation at Risk report came out uh, that really talked about how unprepared we were and, and how our schools had begun to fail for a whole variety of reasons. And we started this much larger narrative about schools failing, businesses needs not being met, and economic growth was going to be constrained as a result at least in the narrow context of the United States. And when we bothered to pick our heads up and look internationally, we saw that those same patterns of inequity uh, were playing out on a global scale and exactly the slides that, that Stephen showed earlier to kick us off. Um, let me see if I can share this one slide right now. Currently, I, I read an, org uh, an organization called Pencil. Uh, we're a nonprofit in New York City that can makes it easy for the business community. Right again. Uh, makes it easy for the business community to connect with the public schools. Um, but New York City is, is really a, a laboratory for the larger education challenge across the United States. One in every 300 Americans goes to public school in New York City, 1.1 million out of about uh, 311, 320 million. So we see all the challenges and all the opportunities. And as you're Thinking about this conversation about education, I would draw your attention to, to the slide 
um, differentiate between education broadly and schooling. And we often equate the two, but schooling occupies most of our conversation, at least here in the United States, when we say education. And this carries through. Our schools meet four basic functional needs. They're custodial. Think about every parent right now struggling to educate their kids and have to take care of them from eight in the morning until three in the afternoon and get their work done and participate in Zoom calls. Uh, Mark, I hope your, four, your birthday party went well yesterday, uh, but the prep call, we got interrupted. And that is really the intersection of this custodial function that we used to rely on schools for, but now that we're all locked at home, we're finding other ways to do that. We live in a modern society. We expect schools to help develop our kids into modern human beings that can navigate society and do all the things that are necessary. It's why we don't let them great. out of school until they're I've, adults. Just a, a wrap up comment, sorry. Yep. Job readiness is the skills conversation we're talking about and we still haven't figured out a way while we're all locked at home to have people practice democracy. All of these functions are beginning to unbundle right now and there'll be opportunities as we begin to think about what we're going to need moving forward. Most importantly, there's a difference between what are gonna be the practical needs that districts and schools and colleges will be facing in the fall trying to get back versus the long-term changes we need to evolve these systems to a new way of right. working rather than continuing to reinvent institutions that were built for an industrial era that is uh, quickly moving past us. And and I have to ask you a side question. Um, our soccer team is playing the last two weeks. When when do you plan on rejoining the uh, playing soccer again? Uh, I'm your goalkeeper, so it'll be a while before I'm back. Because last time I was out, you guys ended up tearing a muscle in that's, my shoulder. So that's a different be... question. I haven't I haven't rejoined, but it's, all right. We'll, we'll pass on that one. Um, Sarah, do you want to give a quick perspective before we? I'm going to let up it up to Q and A. You're muted, Sarah. Can you hear me now? Yep, you're good. Okay, I what I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna show my slides, what a break. And I want to, uh, I, I want to kind of get real about education. It's about human beings and it's about people and it's about compassion. And I agree with everything everybody has said. And I just want to share, I used to work as the legislative analyst for education in the New York State Senate. I wrote legislation. I did policy. At the end of the day, I realized where it really mattered is who's actually touching the students in the classroom. So I went from a high Powered, but people think job to what I think is more powerful and a privilege to being a teacher. I appreciate you having a teacher at the table. I want to just share that my area of expertise is in resilience. That's what my research is in. That's what my book's about. Um, I want to just leave you with these things. Resilience is not a trait. Resilience has been, I've been working in this field for over, you know, uh, 15 uh, years talking about resilience. No one would listen. Now it's the buzzword, the word du jour, and people are getting it wrong. Resilience is not a trait. Resilience is a process. The wrong question is, does a student or does an individual, are they resilient? That's the wrong question. The question is, everybody has the capacity. We have to say, what can we do to tap someone's resilience? And my work is all about the research what is behind the theories of resilience? And I brought resilience to schools, to businesses. And the other thing I want to share, I've got so much, but I want to share, wait, I want to share one more thing. One that more thing. <laughs> my thing that I want to share is this is about investing, funding. Please don't forget the schools and the teachers. There are so many opportunities out there to look for investing with teachers and schools and students. And students aren't high risk. 
the environments they come from are high risk environments. Students themselves are not high risk, the environments they come from. Okay, I'm off my soapbox. No, no, okay, thank you. All right, well, listen, we had a, a range of perspectives. Um, we're gonna op open it for a few questions it, it, or, or comments. But, but, you know, obviously what we wanna, we fit this, what really should have been a deep dive for 90 minutes into a, a briefing. Um, you can thank me or blame me for that. So um, let it be a catalyst for, for such a deep dive. Any, but any questions in the meantime? I have a question. And this isn't really directed at any, any one person, but you know, maybe um, uh, you know, it's worthwhile to, to uh, get a variety of, of responses. You know, given the current environment and the uncertainty around uh, schools, college campuses, um, and, and what's happening in middle schools and high schools, uh, do we see a big impact on the quality of education among the, uh, the haves and have nots, people who are able to afford you know, better, better equipment, better, better computers, uh, the higher uh, economically advantaged neighborhoods versus the lower economically advantaged neighborhoods. And, and what is the impact going forward of losing a year, two years of, of that as we look forward five, 10 years from now? Um, you know, we have a lot of social unrest in this country today, and I think this can really add to it. It's really ultimately concerning. I'm going to stab at it. I think the short answer is yes, absolutely. Uh, we'd be fooling ourselves if we didn't think there's going to be a major impact for this, particularly among our most vulnerable populations. Um, think about the stability of internet connections. New York City has given out somewhere in the neighborhood of 250,000 devices simply trying to get to the basic level of people getting access to what is largely video driven stuff without live interaction. So the inequities are gonna, that are going to emerge from this are only gonna deepen the range of challenges that we have. And uh, I, I think there's gonna need to be some real attention paid to the implications of that moving forward. And, and just real quick, Greg, and I, that's great, because I think of it in terms of content and in terms of delivery, and I think of it not only at the uh, school system, the, 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 the K through 12, um, but also in the colleges and, and how many colleges will survive, how many colleges are gonna be equipped to be able to deliver really good, um, appropriate teleeducation and which are not. And I, and I see this as a potential massive problem across the board. Anyway, I think I interrupted Chris, she was about to speak. No, I was, I was just going to say that there's also, um, here in Ohio, I'll speak with some specificity to here, there will be some issues with not just the divide, the great digital divide that we saw exposed, but we have no assessments happening for, we don't really know how long at this point. So we have that coupled with students that not only are marginalized, but also, you know, we have special needs students and those students that have health, you know, th this has turned into something that I don't think any of us were ever prepared for. So the equity divide is, is actually growing and the way to assess them is, is largely the onus of that will fall on to schools individually that are prepared to do so, but not every school is prepared to do so. So it, this keeps me up, up at night. So I would love to talk further about it. It definitely keeps me up at night because you can only, buy so many hotspots and the money is finite and the CARES funding yeah. doesn't cover it. And these, you know, it's not the same for some of these kids. Not everybody can do online learning. Not everybody can do hybrid. That's why I have, there, have, there has to be choices. And, and those are becoming limited because of the virus and because of other things right now. Is this a private market solution or does it have to be a public market solution? And I, I don't know what the solution I is. Think but, we, I think but. it's a hybrid. In my opinion, I always think public-private hybrid is the best way to, to for me, I think I'm, it's a blend. They're, they're both got to be part of the solution, but you have to think about the scale of the investments that are going to be required. Uh, Mike Bloomberg used to joke around in New York City, somebody came and offered him $100 million to change the education system in New York City. And he said, that's great, but the annual budget of the New York City schools is $28 billion. So ultimately there might be a role to play for private investment in terms of innovation, showing models, showing paths to that new system. But ultimately there's gonna to need to be a public investment if we're gonna sustain any of the solutions. Oh. 
or else it's going to be the least vulnerable, the most vulnerable that are going to get left behind again. So, Greg, on New York, New York City schools, if I can just ask, I mean, it's New York itself has a huge deficit. You know, they're they're I, I, they're cutting the arts to the bone. They're cutting. You know, how does how does it deal with education? I, I mean, there there's cuts there. The education budget had had grown, um, and there's a lot. I mean, look, I've got a perspective from the prior administration. There's a lot of fluff put back in the budget that's now going to have to be cut. That's probably not necessary. Um, but ultimately, the challenge you have is that the system's just not designed to work the way it's going to be asked to work. They're only going to be able to have nine kids in a class at one time. Kids are going to be going once every three days. 20% of the teachers and 20% of the kids are probably going to opt out for virtual learning to begin with. Um, that, that's just not what this system was designed to, to do. So the, the money is one of the challenges, but the practical reality of, of delivering schooling in this environment is going to be challenged at its core, even if all the money in the world was available. I'd like to say one other thing about all this, and I mentioned it yesterday, and that is we have a habit in education of putting money somewhere and then expecting radical change immediately when uh, through a school, whether it be an evaluation process or scores. And those of us who have been in the classrooms know that education change has a window of three to five years. And so I would like to invite people when they are investing in schools to do it for a term, not just an overnight, did it happen and work in one year. I think it's really important to provide uh, a window to see how change occurs over time. Um, that happens over and over in education. We want something to happen overnight and uh, it doesn't. Exactly. The only thing that happened overnight is teachers went online. Kudos to teachers, whether they could do it or not, and they provided for their students. Hey, Mark, uh, it's, it's Rob Colarini. I have a, just a quick uh, different question. Um, I think in the NYU presentation, they were good to bring up some of the international aspects. Um, I think now you've got, you know, in dealing with COVID recovery on some of the immigration issues and just some of the policy issues of these international students. Um, you know, one of the good things of 360 is, you know, we've been able to connect, you know, with, you know, different continents, but uh, does anyone of the panelists have comments on the loss of the international um, um, exchange experience with uh, the students, the professors, the community, and this could be maybe at least at the, at the college level or, um, or, or further down to the, um, uh, to the uh, younger students? I don't know if Lisa's on, she had technical difficulties. I just did, I did read today that if you're on online only, uh, the students lose their visa with the new with this administration. But well, they're any, also anyone? Getting, they're getting kind of deported, I think, as well. They're getting deported back to their countries if it's uh, if it is an online basis. Well, I think there's a, another complexity to this, um, and it's simple. It's the time zone change. So you're going to have a class at nine o'clock in the morning or two o'clock in the afternoon in New York. And somebody from Asia is going to be taking that class at 9 p.m. or 2 a.m. if they want, uh, you know, a, an online real experience. And how realistic is online courses taught live if you have um, considering the time zones? And, th mm -hmm. and then if you say, well, we're going to have PDF versions, um, tuitions start to come down because why are you paying the same amount of money uh, for a PDF version as for a live professor? I, I, I think the implications are, are significant. I think, and then colleges will be losing tremendous amounts of money by having a, an, a, you know, having an economic structure that has a high fixed cost associated with housing 10, 20,000 students that they're not going to be getting, but they're still going to have the expenses. I, I think the jury's out. The question is, you, you know, all, all hands on to get a vaccine to try and, and return to normal because we're not equipped at all to deal with um, uh, the radical changes that are happening uh, uh, to us right now. I, I can add one thing too. I, on the international front, um, particularly in Asia, oh, can you hear me? 
Um, yep. Particularly in Asia, like there's also security and technology challenges too, for particularly in China, for students to actually access some of the data, it's restricted. So, so there are challenges there. Um, I don't know how the schools are gonna work that out. Um, the other thing that I was gonna mention is that I think with college students, and I'm, this is just my own thought, this is nothing I'm getting from Denison, but um, I was speaking to a friend of mine in New York who works in banking in New York recently, and he does a lot of hiring, and he said they're already starting to question how they're gonna hire out of the classes that are graduating in the next year or two who have had a fair amount of remote learning and what, how they're gonna assess whether these students have the same quality education that students in the past have had. And so I think that's just something that could become a bigger problem as next year's graduates. I mean, this year's graduates are just kind of stuck in a bad uh, job market. But I think going forward, as you have kids who have done more and more remote learning, employers are going to want to really be digging in to figure out who did it well and who didn't, um, and questioning how good was the education these kids have got um, at the college level. Maybe they'll be better prepared for remote work. <laughs> and I think you actually bring up a really interesting um, idea around mentorship. I've heard the referral to close mentorship and the fact is that more than ever there is a need slash opportunity to really um, work with the students individually as they move through these periods of transition even more so than in the past. So it really sort of is suggesting you know developing more commitment around the idea of whether it's training, communicating information, sharing ideas of best practices, and um, maybe even developing process around connecting um, earlier and better from a mentorship perspective. Is there any concern about the socialization of even younger children? Uh, I've I met a couple recently whose nine month old has never seen another child. And if you extrapolate that outwards, what does that mean for uh, groups of young kids who may be seriously under socialized by the time they return to school? Tora, you're, you're in the exact direction I was headed to my que the initial question because I think if you're talking about preparing executives or just even entry level folks into the multinationals, and you run into this phase where they haven't had as much exposure to uh, international students or professors or the like, um, you know, they come out with sort of um, less competitive than let's say folks just two years ago. So, but that's an interesting point at the, at the younger age on the socialization side. I'd like to make, I mean, a, I'd like to comment on that. And this is, um, I have, it, uh, some interesting experiences regarding socialization of children. I taught uh, third and fourth grade in a gifted and talented homogeneous classroom. I was forced to do that um, to, by my principal. And some, I'm going to just put it out there and let you know that some of the most uh, difficult socialization skills came from those students the gifted and talented. They wanted to focus in their own world. They weren't collaborative. Their parents put stress on them. And so I think it's so interesting that now all of a sudden we have such an emphasis on socialization. And I totally agree. So the pediatrics, American pediatrics, they're trying to get people to go to school uh, because of the socialization issues. So I understand that. But there's also an issue issue that I wonder, are kids going to start being afraid of adults when they're, they're not supposed to go near adults? It's like, I, I wonder how our little ones in preschool, if they're going to start being afraid. And I just, I, I'm saddened by the fact that uh, we can't give hugs to kids. And we, and you tell me how you're going to get a room of 30 or nine kids even to not uh, want to hug a teacher. And um, Try teaching preschool with masks. Uh, socialization is going to be an issue for sure. So, 
so I've got a four-year-old, an 11-year-old, and a 15-year-old, so I know this, uh, how this is playing out, at least at those, those levels. But what's interesting, and I take these points, is, uh, April 30th, it uh, seems like an attorney ago, uh, President Weinberg from Denison was pointing out a few things as we did our industry review. And he will be back. We are going to do, um, on July 30th, there will be an education breakout. Um, we're going to move into breakouts now, and you can continue in this education subject breakout, uh, or you can join one, um, you know, that relates to your alumni. And just given that.